Good evening, gentlemen, and uh, great to see you. I may just ask if you can hear me and see me okay. Should be able to see the PowerPoint on the screen as well. Um, once I hear back from at least somebody, I know that we're working. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, good. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Right, well, assuming everything's working fine, we will carry on. Um, hopefully you can see that PowerPoint, right? Anyway, good to um, be back doing the webinar. Um, as you know, those of you that were with us before, we had um, a series of webinars during the lockdown, um, which was a blessing, got some good feedback from those. And we are now back, of course, um, doing our men's ministry from church as normal, which is great. But we wanted to still put these webinars out there to allow people from outside um, our church, different parts of New Zealand and other countries as joined in before, to um, take part. So we're gonna do this once a month and put the information out if you're on the Eternal Purpose Ministries email list. So um, hopefully that'll be a blessing as we do this together once a month. We'll be looking at various relevant topics, critical issues, um, and things that are hopefully just um, really are impactful to our lives as men, and again, relate to our lives as Christian men. So uh, please let me know if you can't see or hear anything um i'm out of practice now it feels like we're speaking to the computer back to speaking to normal people which has been a huge blessing so i'll just pray and then we'll start father thank you so much for this opportunity to encourage the men in your word and lord i pray as we look at this subject of humility tonight lord that you'd really um give us an openness of heart and mind to your word first and foremost and that we would really hear and understand what you want us to hear and understand, and that we would seek by the power of your spirit to apply that to our lives, that we might bear fruit to your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I will um, just whisk through our slides here. You are familiar with who we are and the format, the guys that are registered tonight. So we'll just get straight to our topic, as I just mentioned in my prayer, the power of humility. Um, a subject that may be not looked at as much as it perhaps should be, particularly um, within the context of men's discipleship. And I guess we can sometimes easily confuse the concept of humility as something that's a little uh, soft for a man or a bit too touchy-feely. But hopefully, as we'll see tonight, that really isn't the case. And I can tell you in one statement why that isn't the case, and then we'll um, pray and look at this topic in more detail. So the reason that humility is not something that should be foreign to men or is only for weaker or more sensitive, softer men is simply because, ready for it? Jesus was a man of humility. Jesus was a man of humility. That's all we need to know, as I'm sure we'd agree. There is no greater example of what we have of what it means to live as a godly man as the example we have in Christ when he walked on this earth. So um, I was reading my notes there about praying, but I'd already prayed, so we'll continue on. Now, as has been the custom with these webinars, what we do is we start with a bit of a look at worldview. Um, what are some of the ideas, some of the opinions, some of the thoughts out there in the world in general that relate to our subject? And then what does the Bible say about those things so that we can really get some biblical context to what we are looking at? So we'll look at this aspect of worldview first then. And again, this is looking at how we see the world, whether the word of God determines how we view the world or whether the world determines how we view the word of God. So we're contrasting here what the world says and what the word says with regard to this subject of uh, humility. So 
I'm just going to make an adjustment here so that we can see that on a bigger screen. So what the world says and what the word says. Now this study again is on the power of humility and as we well know, we're living in a time where out there in the world, the lines are so blurred between what it means to be a man and a woman and what behaviors and characteristics are more inherent to a man or a woman. Since 2014, for example, on Facebook, it has allowed its users to choose from 58 different gender options. There's probably more now. And in addition to this, there's the choice of three different pronouns that, pronouns that can be used, him, her, and their. These are people who identify as two or more people. And so this idea of masculinity has been so warped and perverted by the world, it no longer means what it should mean. And there's a major drive for people to accept both their masculine and feminine side as a pushback against stereotypes of real men needing to be only macho, dominant and staunch. The problem is the decreasing stereotypical idea of a real man needing to be macho, tough and unemotional is an unbalanced and unbiblical picture of what true biblical manhood is. And so this fight against manhood in some parts exists because there are men out there who think it is unmanly to be sensitive to another person's needs, emotional about anything, kind, caring, and relevant to tonight's study, humble. But that is not the biblical idea. And so the problem that has occurred is that the world has taken the pendulum so far the other way, it states that men should be free to be not just sensitive or emotional and caring, humble men, but that they should be free to be feminine. And this is the distortion. Now, as one article I read earlier today titled Be a Real Man, Two Myths Debunked states, and I quote here, the idea that acting feminine as a man would make him less of a man stems from, at the very least, two myths that have permeated our culture for decades. The first myth is based around the idea that masculinity and femininity are mutually exclusive and opposite. According to this myth, you can't be a true man if you possess too many feminine qualities. Listen carefully to what it says here. Like I said before, there is a stigma for men who are too sensitive or too emotionally open or are too into feminine things such as fashion or makeup. Society expects all men to be manly, which is usually associated with physical strength, being emotionally stoic, enjoying sports and cars and action movies, among other traits. However, men can be manly, but still accept and love being feminine. And then they say the other myth that hinders men from being more accepting of femininity is its negative association with gay men due to the ever-present homophobia that exists in our patriarchal, patriarchal culture. End quote. Now notice if you did the huge jump and link that was made there saying that there's a stigma for men who are too sensitive or too emotionally open or are into feminine things such as fashion or makeup. Just a huge jump there that being emotionally open or sensitive is then linked to things like being into fashion or makeup. And this extreme thinking is played out even more at the end of the article where the conclusion is this quote, if men can learn to take what the patriarchy calls flaws in femininity, empathy, sensitivity, and emotional honesty, for example, as well as help dismantle the societal support of hypermasculinity, <coughs> excuse me, extreme bravado, dominance and entitlement, to name a few, then everyone will be better off. I just need to cough. Apologies for that. Um, I got sick last week <clears throat> and then preaching yesterday and a voice is not so good. So um, I'll try to make sure I hang in there. So sifting through that kind of wrong thinking, we need to remember as Christian men that there are two distinct genders, male and female. But there are characteristics 
which should be present in the lives of both males and females, such as empathy, kindness, compassion, emotional honesty, without a man feeling like he's being feminine. So they will and should look different in a man, of course. But as Christian men, we must embrace the fact that it is not feminine to be kind or caring. It is not feminine to be sensitive to someone's needs, emotionally honest, tender or humble. And I want to speak about that at the outset here because there's a lot of confusion out there. Yes, we do need to trade strong-minded, unemotional machoism for a more balanced biblical character. But that doesn't mean that we cross to the other side and embrace uniquely feminine traits, such as the need to be protected by a husband, the need to be led by a husband, the willingness to live in submission to a husband, or the need to dress in a feminine manner in contrast to a husband. These are all healthy feminine traits which do not decrease a woman's worth, intellect, or spirituality, but they're entirely inappropriate if they exist in a man. So, Back to our topic, a little detour there, looking at the power of humility in the life of the Christian man. What does the world say about this characteristic? Let's have a look at a few things. Well, at times the world would say that humility is having a low view of yourself. And it's not entirely untrue, but it's not really accurate when we compare it to what the biblical understanding is so that's what the world says the word says humility is having an accurate view of yourself in romans 12 16 it says be of the same mind toward one another do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble do not be wise in your own opinion so when you have the same mind toward one another you're viewed as god views you when you're not setting your mind on high things thinking that you deserve better than others but you associate with the humble and when you're not wise in your own opinion that you put your opinion of yourself above god's then you have an accurate view of yourself and that's as we'll see what humility essentially is an accurate view of yourself um, and an accurate view of who the lord is and who we are in light of who the lord is so the world says it's a low view And humility is actually an accurate view. The world says humility is something inherent in the good of humanity. If there was a humble person out there, and of course the basic traits of humility can be displayed by an unbeliever, um, that'll always find its tracing back to um, a Christian influenced society, because you may not see this in other cultures, throughout history. But if there's a humility to be extolled, then people are going to say that that's inherent in the good of humanity. But biblically speaking, humility is a fruit of God's influence upon a person's life. True humility is born out of one's relationship with Christ. And Colossians 3.12 says, therefore, as the elect of God, so The context there is the people of God, the chosen people of God, the born again believers, holy believers, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. God would not ask us to put on, to exercise humility if it was in our own strength. As Christians, we can walk in humility because of the work of Christ, the work of God in our lives. The world says humility is demoralizing again this is not reflective of everybody in the world but some of the common um, ideas out there in the world humility is demoralizing we should be proud of who we are and we hear that so much these days you know put it out there who you are don't be ashamed whatever it is but the scripture by contrast says humility is a biblical characteristic so it's certainly not demoralizing because it's a, a biblical characteristic and it's a good biblical characteristic and it's one that god rewards with his grace so as christians we're not to be walking around proud of who we are just being us but we are to be thankful for what god has made us james 4 verse 6 says but he gives more grace therefore he says god resists the proud 
but gives grace to the humble. What a beautiful verse. God resists the proud. He resists the one who says, I'm proud of who I am. But the humble one who has an accurate view of himself, God gives grace. He extends his grace. If we want God's grace, we want to walk in humility. Here are some great quotes about the characteristic of humility from some godly men. A.W. Tozer said, For the Christian, humility is absolutely indispensable. Without it, there can be no self-knowledge, no repentance, no faith, and no salvation. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I love that quote. Again, that shows us it's the accurate view. You're not really focused on yourself. You're thinking of yourself less. David Wilkinson, pastor from Times Square Church, says a humble person is not one who thinks little of himself, hangs his head and says, I'm nothing. Rather, he is one who depends wholly on the Lord for everything in every circumstance. So just a few good quotes there to help shape our idea of what humility is. So that's the um, the worldview section that we're going to look at for this part of the study. If anyone has any questions, please fire away, but I'm going to move on to the next section, the biblical instruction. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter two, but again, if you do have a question while you're doing that, you can feel free to ask that. Um, And if you have any questions at any point throughout, just pop them in the question box and I'll be happy to look at those a bit later on. So Philippians chapter two is what we're going to be looking at. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4. As we look at this subject, the power of humility. So I'll just read the passage and then we're going to break this down and see what we can extract from this passage that speaks to us about humility. Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, If any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It's an incredible passage from the book of Philippians, one of Paul's most, or if not the most, tender, affectionate books written to the believers at Philippi who he had visited on several occasions. He's just at the end of chapter one been talking about the external conflicts, the suffering that is granted to believers, the context of that suffering was persecution. And then he turns his focus towards what can really be inward conflict if they're not walking right between one another. And so as we look at this, we'll look first at verse one. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. The therefore links to what was spoken before, again, addressing the external conflicts and suffering and the strength they could have in that. And the word if there, or if, is is often better translated since. You may have heard this before. Um, It's a rhetorical phrase, but it can be misread in the English. Therefore, since there is consolation in Christ, this isn't Paul saying, if there is, if we can find some, we know there is. So he's saying, since there is consolation in Christ, and there is great consolation in Christ himself, in our sufferings, in our conflicts, we can always come to Christ and find our consolation in him he says if any comfort of love there is comfort in the love of christ recognizing what he's done for us how far he has gone to redeem us there is fellowship of the spirit the word fellowship there is coin and ear which is a real strong word of depth indicating a, a tight partnership and we have that 
with the Holy Spirit who dwells in us permanently as believers. And then, of course, there is affection, another form of love, and mercy, not getting what we deserve. So there is consolation in Christ. There is comfort from his love. There is fellowship of the Spirit. There is affection and there is mercy. So this causes us to think, as we consider this um, topic of humility, with a Christ focus first and foremost. We must start by thinking about the incredible things that Christ has done for us. If we start with our focus on ourselves and how we're doing and look out at how we're supposed to respond to others, we may fall short. We may set our standards too low in a sense, whereas when we look at Christ, we recognize that we fall short, we need his help, but we're also encouraged by what he has done for us. It puts us in our place in a good way. As we consider our conduct towards others, we recognize how much we've been forgiven, how much grace and mercy we've been shown. And that can stir our heart and put our heart into a good place to be able to respond right towards other people. And so if I was making this into a point, if you're taking any notes, I would say this. Take a big look at Christ, all he is, all he has done for you before you really start to defend how you should act towards others. Now, this topic of humility can be challenging to us. Not now when we're sitting here with a cup of coffee, perhaps, and watching a webinar on a computer in the comfort of our own home. But when we're in the rub of difficulty or conflict in relationships, humility is a challenge to walk in. So we must remember that we must take a big look at Christ, all he is, all he's done for you before we start to defend how we should act towards others. Because we will defend it. We will excuse ourselves. We will be in a situation where we should walk in humility and our flesh doesn't want to. Our only hope is to think at that point of Christ, the greatness of Christ, what he's done, all that he is. And again, that puts us in our right place. It humbles us to be able to walk in humility. If we miss this aspect, we really just start to operate out of our own effort, which will lead nowhere. So we do have to start here. I'll say that point one more time. Take a big look at Christ, all he is and all he's done for you, before you really start to defend how you should act towards others. Moving on to verse two, Paul says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So he says there, firstly, fulfill my joy. Now, the more the believers that Paul wrote to were walking like Christ, seeking to become more like Christ, the happier he was. Paul was happy. He was blessed. He was made joyful by their progress. So he says, fulfill my joy. Not because he wanted it to be all about making him happy. He was just saying that the, the greatness of his joy is in their progress in Christ. He then says how to do this by being like-minded. Now, like-minded is really speaking of having no, not speaking, sorry, of not having any opinion or any personality, but instead speaks of deferring to a common or a greater cause and really not making principles out of preferences, if that makes sense. I think in a church context or a family context, to be like-minded is to say, look, this, this is what is best for us as a whole, rather than always chipping away at what is best for the whole with our own personal preferences with things that just really are more on our agenda and beneficial to us exclusively rather than beneficial to everybody again it doesn't mean that we don't have opinions or personality but in a family or a church context there is a need for us to to have the same mind to walk together he also says the same love and this can speak of not being 
partial in our love or affection towards others or to form cliques where we really only like certain people and display love to certain people in the church or even within our family to treat them in a lesser manner. The same love, the same love that Christ has shown us, we show others. There's not to be a different type of love. One accord. This speaks again of being united in their affections, but their affections that are for Christ. So a beautiful word here, one accord, two words, that we have great affection for Christ and the things that he desires. And we collectively have that. So we're of one accord. We desire what Christ wants. See what we're seeing here. We often talk about the, the analogy of spokes on a wheel that get closer to the center. The center's like Christ. The closer the spokes get, the closer people get to one another. The more our affections are for Christ and the things of Christ, the closer we are to one another, the more in, in accord we are. He then says one mind, which is to be united in their thinking. That as they think, that they are thinking of the greater cause of the whole. They're not just thinking selfishly, they're thinking spiritually. And so you think about these phrases here, like-minded, same love, one accord, one mind. This all equals something, unity. It all equals unity unity a deep abiding internal unity and unity is so so important in the body of christ unity is so so important in our homes now you may say i thought we were studying humility not unity well that's correct but to be more specific, if you remember, we are talking about the power of humility. And here it is. The power of humility is that it creates unity, which creates strength, fruitfulness, and stability, both in the church and in our families. Hence, it is very, very powerful. Did you catch that? The power of humility is that humility creates unity, which creates strength, fruitfulness, and stability, creates effectiveness, both in the church and in our families. Therefore, humility is and can be very, very powerful. Now, a note, of course, unity should never come at the expense of truth. That is not what we're talking about here. We're not saying about be united as a family, regardless of truth. Be united as Christians with other Christians who have some really off beliefs or even people who aren't really Christians just so we can be united. Not at all. We unite around truth. But we unite as believers so the body of Christ can function properly and effectively. And I'll just go from this passage and pop up on the screen here a passage from Ephesians 4, uh, 15 and 16 that says this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. This is speaking of the church, from whom the whole body join and knit together. So notice those words. There is cohesion. There is closeness. It's talking about a body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. In other words, every part has an important role to play, has an essential aspect in the whole. And then it says, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. So just look at those words there. Describing the church, joined, knit together, every part has its share. And what's the result of this? It causes growth of the body for the edifying or the building up of itself in love. So you see growth, effectiveness, edification, and love. How? By the unity of the body working together, tightly connected, each part doing its share for the good of the whole, not each part dividing off and doing its own thing independently, which is really a description of cancer in the body, if you think about it. So pride 
is a hindrance to unity because pride is the antithesis of humility. But humility is a gateway to unity. So I hope that makes sense what I'm saying here that we're talking about humility, we're talking about the power of humility, and the power of humility is in the unity that it creates, which provides strength and effectiveness in family, in a church. So here's another point then to note here from verse two, recognize that humility is powerful because it creates unity, which leads to strength and effectiveness in our churches and homes. Recognize that humility is powerful because it creates unity, which leads to strength and effectiveness in our churches and homes. So we'll look at verse three of Philippians two next, as we continue on. Verse three says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So I mentioned before that pride is obviously a hindrance to unity and humility. What else can hinder um, unity or humility? Well, as we see here, selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Paul says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Selfish ambition is the motivation to put our goals, plans, and ideals above everything else and above everyone else. There can be a godly ambition this is talking about selfish ambition. This is a killer in the church and it's a killer in the family. As Christian men, God has called us to lead our families in the will of God, not the will of us, the will of our plans and our goals and our purposes. And this can happen, sadly. There can be a, a Christian home that's dysfunctional because the father is really driving the family forward to achieve his own goals and agenda and his own plans and purposes and not really thinking of the whole or thinking of what God has called him to do. It's a selfish ambition. We then see the word conceit, selfish ambition or conceit, which is closely linked to pride. And this can be described as an excessively favorable opinion of one's own ability, importance or wit. Not a nice characteristic at all an excessively favorable opinion of our own ability, importance, or wit. When we live with the feeling that we're so important or so able or so talented, we're out of God's will. We're working against the unity that Paul pleaded with the Philippians and all Christians to have. And so, again, it's a killer in a church, in a family. It's a, a hindrance to humility when we walk in conceit, when we are so inflated on our view of ourselves. Now, we may all listen in, and I'm sure right now say what well, maybe i don't really feel i'm that extreme and that may be true but we do have to guard ourselves against times where in the heat of the moment suddenly we consider our view our feelings our goal very important and maybe too important so as we look at this characteristic of humility it's simple to diagnose what will be hindering that again humility is a correct view of self Pride is an inflated view of self. Humility is seeing ourselves as God sees us and seeing God as he truly is. And I know very well in my own life that humility is hindered at times or absent when I react to a certain situation or respond in a situation or move forward in a situation thinking most of all about how it affects me, what my opinions, my desires are, or how I will be benefited or not. It's so easy to do this. The flesh likes to take care of itself. And even in a family context, in a church context, we can be driven by what benefits us the most. And it normally involves me taking myself far, far too seriously and taking others and their, new, their needs and desires not seriously enough. So I'll give you a few examples of how this might look in people's lives. Maybe a, a marriage example. Maybe as a husband, it's when you are challenged or corrected by your wife. And whether that's in a 
respectful, loving way, or whether that's in a unloving reactionary way, how do we respond? And I've made this mistake many times responding the wrong way, but it can be so easy for us to, to not walk in humility at that moment when it really matters, because all of a sudden what we think, what we care about, how we feel trumps everything else. That's what's most important. But humility, put yourself in that situation, is to line up my wife's view alongside God's. That's humility. Not what do I think, how is it affecting me, but is what my wife's saying similar to what God would say if he looked at the situation? I just don't like hearing it from her. If it's not, then I need to align myself with God's view. Now, if our wife is saying something that is out of line, it's a stretch, it's an exaggeration, it's untrue, we want to line ourselves up with what we believe God will be saying, doesn't mean we have to go along with it, but we should certainly seek to listen to the emotions beneath that, because sometimes we know that our wives may say more than they intended to, or exaggerate something because they're feeling hurt. So that doesn't mean that we write it off. We just need to look at the emotions below that and deal with that, what, what's actually causing the problem. So that's just a bit of an example in a marriage context. What about among a group of friends or colleagues, friends at church or colleagues at work, in a situation where we feel something happens where our skill, our worth, or our achievements, or our talent has just been overlooked? maybe in a conversation where someone else is being praised or recognized and no one really fully gets the contribution that we might have made or how good we have been in a certain area. And so the temptation is to push ourselves up a little in people's eyes. We might do it subtly, but the root is pride. We might just drop a little hint or say something to make sure that we are put back equal or at least equal if not better around with the other people because all of a sudden because of the circumstances it looked like we were less than what we know we really are humility in that situation is to line up with what god's view of ourselves and line that alongside what everyone else is thinking maybe everyone else is not so enamored by us what about god is God enamored by our skills and by our achievements in such a way that puffs us up? Probably not. But if we line ourselves up with God's view of us, recognizing that first and foremost, we seek to please him, it can just take the heat out. It can allow us to just settle and go, it doesn't matter that we're overlooked. It doesn't matter that they've not recognized this or recognized that achievement. We don't have to kind of get all antsy about, oh, oh, but I did this or I did that or I can prove myself. And men can be like this around other men. We can do it in a jesting way, and I think that's okay. But in, in a serious way, it can really get to the core if we feel like we're not holding our own or not, not being seen as, as valued. But humility rests in God's opinion of ourselves, not others. Um, maybe another example would be in an area where we have sinned or failed. We've messed up, we've done something dumb and something makes us look maybe worse than we think we are normally. Um, we look, I mean, I had remember situations like this where I was working on the ambulance. I'd be working with a different person. I would do something poorly and look silly and feel embarrassed and maybe be corrected for it. And I'm thinking, but I, d I don't normally do that. This was just a bad moment. Am I quick to defend myself or can I rest? in a humility that says what God thinks is what matters, not necessarily what other people think. Because we can react with anger, embarrassment, but what does humility do? Again, it lines ourselves up with God's view of us and what really matters at the moment. There may be a time and a place to, to, to speak honestly, because again, true humility is being honest about ourself and say, I wouldn't normally do this, I would do that. But if the motive is, fear of how we might look and that we want to make sure we're still up on that pedestal there's a wrong motive there so just a couple of examples there and and all this to say that as we choose to walk in humility by faith as we in the middle of the situation line ourselves up with god's view of us thinking big things about christ and 
and our right place in Christ, then we do our part to make a marriage stronger, the church stronger, our witness of Christ stronger. Do you see how that ties in? In a situation where rubber meets the road, we walk in humility. That humility that we display creates more unity because we are not pulling away. We are actually lessening ourselves so that there can be a greater focus on not us, not us, but others. And that makes a marriage stronger as we're brought in humility closer to our wife. It makes a church stronger as we're brought in humility closer to our brothers and sisters and our witness of Christ stronger as people see that we can actually get it wrong as Christians, unbelievers see that we can get things wrong and we can humble ourselves and apologize. <clears throat> So we see here then a truth, this. An elevated, incorrect view of ourselves will hinder humility. So just think about that where the rubber meets the road. You'll probably be in a situation tomorrow where you can put this into practice. A conflict, a difficult situation, a time when you're overlooked, an elevated, incorrect view of ourselves will hinder humility in that moment, if we take ourselves too seriously or think too much of ourselves. And what we see um, in each of these examples, as I talked about the correct way that we might walk through those, ties in with the rest of the verse there where it says, verse three, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So we see how the humility is hindered by selfish ambition or conceit but when we choose to walk in lowliness of mind and that phrase lowliness of mind can be translated humility it's the same word it's just translated in um, either humility or lowliness of mind throughout the new testament let each esteem others better than himself and this is really the essence of humility we've seen what hinders it here's what produces it to esteem the needs the desires the successes, the progress of others as more important than our own is true and genuine humility. To esteem the needs, the desires, the successes, the progress of others as more important than our own is true and genuine humility. To be graciously overtaken, overlooked for the benefit of others. And this doesn't mean we don't take care of our own needs as the next verse is going to clear up for us. But in the context of church and family, what it means is that we don't get in the way with our independence and our selfishness, but we fuel and motivate the way by our humility. We create unity and strength by humility. So looking at the second part of this verse, we could say this, an elevated preferential view of others will foster humility an elevated preferential view of others will foster humility this is hard if it's attempted in our own strength to elevate others i could teach on this walk away from here and not feel like doing it when rubber meets the road but that's the challenge to apply scripture in the moment to prefer others to defer to others all fosters humility and it's not something that we spray on to the externals of our life humility is a heart attitude we need to ask for god's help to attain it in our lives and it will come more and more naturally quite simply the more focused we are upon christ now as we look at verse four here we see the necessary balance where it says let each of you look out not only for his own interests but also for the interests of others now that's where we go, phew, and we read, not only for his own interests. Our interests, our needs are important, okay? That's a fact, and it's okay. Our needs and interests, if it didn't say that, this would be just so unrealistic. I mean, God says, love others as you love yourself, because he knows we don't have trouble loving ourselves. We don't need to be reminded to do that. So the more 
we are focused upon Christ, the more that our humility will come out naturally. But again, our needs, we need to take care of ourselves. But this is, the, this is the way we need to think about it. Our interests and needs are important to the extent that we are in good spiritual shape to be the best we can for the sake of others. That's the difference. Our needs, our interests are important to the extent that we're in good spiritual shape to be the best we can for the sake of others. Humility is not, I'm nothing, I hate myself, I do nothing for myself. Humility is, I recognize my needs, but I'm not all about me. I don't exist only for me. I have a duty to serve others and meet their needs. And the dictionary definition of humility says the quality of having a modest or low view of one's importance. The quality of having a modest or low view of one's importance. But again, I think that is a true in part, but not as full as the biblical definition, which if you derive it from the, the Greek there, it's, it is having a humble opinion of oneself or a deep sense of one's moral littleness, and that's our right view before God, and it is lowliness of mind. It is just making sure that we're in the pocket in the right place before God. So what we see here then is this. Our own needs are important too, but not at the expense of neglecting the needs of others. So yes, we have needs. That's reality but we shouldn't be taking care of those just at the expense of others thinking of our needs as being more important than everyone else's. Humility is about being wrapped up in Christ, not in ourselves. Humility is being on call for Christ to serve others, not just ourselves. When we come to Christ for salvation, we cannot come apart from coming in humility because we are, in essence saying I'm broken, I need forgiveness and restoration. And those who are truly humble will glory in the grace of God and in the cross, not in self-righteousness, not in their own works. So that's a little bit about humility. It's a big subject, as you can see, and um, this has not been an exhaustive treatment of it at all, but really just seeing what is spoken of in this passage in Philippians. But I do want to read on from Philippians, and we're not going to be breaking this down, but just to read it through once, there couldn't be a better example of this humility demonstrated and proclaimed in Christ himself as in the next few verses in Philippians chapter 2, known as the kenosis. You probably know them fairly well. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Just listen to these verses and how they speak of the humility of Christ and how that can inspire us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God wouldn't say that if it wasn't possible. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven those on earth those of under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father look at verse 8 there he humbled himself to the point of death this is christ god in the flesh who walked in true humility who was so focused on others Yet he didn't shrink back about who he truly was. He wasn't pushing himself down. He was serving others in humility. And as somebody once said, which I think is good advice, it's better to humble yourself than require God to humble you. And that's another good reason why we should walk in humility. God resists the proud and he will humble the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Okay, I hope that's been helpful. We're going to have a look at the um, tools section of some practical application to finish off with. If you have any questions, please type them away now. Um, so you've got time to write it and I've got time to read it. And we will have a look at the, um, 
application next. Sorry that I keep having to take sips of this drink, but I, and thank you if you were praying for my voice because a few points I thought I was going to lose it then. Um, okay, so we'll finish off then looking at some application and as I've been doing in previous webinars, I'm going to use an acronym of the word humble. An acronym of the word humble um, to really illustrate some summary truths here and some practical application that we can do to walk in humility it's a work of god in our hearts but how can we make this more possible in our lives well firstly h humble yourself before god of course that's going to be the first step to walk in humility is to humble yourself initially in consideration of all that christ has done remember when we talked before about a big view of christ the consolation the comfort of love the affection the mercy the fellowship of the spirit if you want to walk in humility if you want more humility in your life begin by humbling yourself remind yourself of the greatness of god by looking at scripture and you will feel smaller in a good way Remind yourself of the goodness of Christ and all that he's done for you. And it will bring you to a lowly place where you can be more soft hearted to walk in humility towards others. The next letter in the acronym is you understand who you are in light of God's truth. And this is kind of linked with the first one. Humble yourself before God in light of all that Christ has done, all that he is, but then understand who you are in light of God's truth. We're not a nothing, we're a something, but not because there's anything in us, but because God has set his love upon us. We have value because God has placed value on us. It's not because of some self-esteem or that we are precious in ourselves. We are precious because God has made us precious because he gave his life for us. Understand who we are in light of God's truth. So, we want the humility before God, recognizing our smallness, but we also want to recognize our identity in Christ, which gives us the confidence to be able to humble ourselves, knowing that we are accepted in him. <clears throat> M. Here's an interesting one. Miss out whenever you can so others can progress. That's a challenge, isn't it? It's very practical. Miss out whenever you can so others can progress. What does that mean? Does that mean if you go away from here and there's three pieces of cake being offered that you should say, no, I won't have any cake, I'm being humble. No, it doesn't mean that. It's just talking about in certain situations, and I'm not gonna give any examples because it might be different for everyone, where you might be tempted to push yourself forward and in doing so, somebody else may not progress, but you want yourself to progress but instead you miss out so they can progress. I don't think that means that if you're going for a position at work, you shouldn't apply for the position because you want other people to progress. I'm talking about situations where it really is neither here nor there, how it affects you. Or even if it does, you can actually let it go. You can step back and you can see somebody else progress ahead of you. And then not tell everyone about it. <laughs> That defeats the purpose of humility. B, back down whenever you can. This is very similar to make others look good. Back down wherever you can to make others look good. And this might be a situation where somebody is talking about something. Maybe they're praised for it. Maybe somebody's impressed by it. And you're tempted to say, wow, this is what I did. So that they can say, wow, that's even better. That's greater. Well, Maybe in those situations, at times, humility is to back down wherever you can to make others look good. It might be in a conversation where Bible study, discussion, you could say something that's a lot more articulate, a lot, lot smarter, a lot more scriptural maybe than somebody who said something before. But watch the motives. If you're doing that to contribute to the group, great. But be careful you're not doing it to sound good and to sound good, especially compared to the person who said something before. Back down wherever you can to make others look good. These are practical. They're not always easy, but they're practical. L, listen to others who love you enough 
to correct you. This is important because humility plays such a part in the giving and receiving of rebuke and growing through loving correction. If somebody brings something to you and, they, and you can't hear it and you react in a proud way or reactionary way, you won't grow. Be willing to listen if somebody loves you enough to say something difficult. That is humility. Even refusing to believe what you think about yourself at that point, but taking their word for it and then going away and praying about it. And again, align yourself up with God's view. Lastly, enjoy the fruit of strength, unity, and effectiveness. That, again, is what humility in our lives creates strength, unity, effectiveness, and you will enjoy that fruit. In fact, you will enjoy the fruit of the whole more than if you'd have just grasped independently to the fruit of what was just good for you. You will learn more to be blessed by the progress of others, by others looking good, even when you could have, but you didn't. That is true humility. So I hope that's practical there. Um, I'll leave that on the screen. And there is a question that came through here from Toma. Greetings, Toma. And I did want to say hello to those of you that were joining in. Um, I don't always do that, but we have Kevin, Toma, Alvin, Gabriel. My son is in the other room. Grant, uh, Jason, Sebastian. So great to see you all. Um, I see a couple of people had raised a hand. Um, was that relating to the question that you typed? Um, you might want to type something in the chat box there. Or were you just saying high five, amen? Anyway, I see a question from Toma. Um, and I'm just going to answer that now. I'll read out the question. So Toma says, in regard to the verse which says, consider others better than yourself, how does that work out when the one with one who is less mature, i.e. a new Christian? Good question. So when it says consider others or esteem others better than yourself, what about one who is less mature? Well, esteeming someone better than yourself doesn't mean that you um, allow them to say or do something that is unwise or unscriptural when you could actually influence that or um, guide them a different way, not at all. In fact, a newer Christian, it is a great opportunity because what the verse is really saying is, let that newer Christian feel that you do consider them as a person, as a brother, better than yourself. In other words, you will defer, you will have give them preferential treatment in some ways. You would do things for them where they might think to themselves, well, why did you do that? Why did you um, sacrificially go that far to help me out? Because I want to consider you better than myself so that is the way i would sort of answer this it's, it's nothing to do with considering that their views or opinions are necessarily better um, if they're more of an immature thinking doesn't mean you can't correct someone's thinking or challenge their thinking it purely means that you're going to consider them better than yourself and that you are others focused that you are putting them ahead of yourself you're giving them the better place where you can, the better situation, the better opportunity. That is what it's talking about. So does that kind of answer the question, Tom? Hopefully it does. Um, I saw another hand raised there. So there, that's that question. Um, any other questions as we finish up? We've got just a minute or so, happy to answer any question. It's been great to um, have you guys tuning in again, and hopefully it's been an encouragement to you. Um, I do hope and pray that you'll be able to walk in humility by the grace of God, and that your wives and that your brothers and sisters at church will see as you apply this, that there is the beautiful characteristic of humility. And you know, if you've seen it in somebody else, it really is a beautiful characteristic. So, um, okay, I don't see any more questions right now. So I will pray and finish off. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we will be putting another webinar on 
uh, next month. So as we put that information out, feel free to share it with others. And if you can tune in, and if you have any suggestions of topics, let me know. Okay, I'll just pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to encourage the guys in the word. And I've been encouraged, Lord, looking again at your word and challenged at this characteristic of humility, Lord, where you really do require us to walk in a, in a lowly path, but in an accurate view of ourself before you. I pray you would help us to know what it actually looks like in our lives to esteem others better than ourselves, to love others. And even as we just discussed, or even if they're um, not as mature in the faith, even if there's areas where they are, they're off in some ways, Lord, help us to know how to love those people. Help us to walk in humility. Help us to not always need to be the one with the answers, the one who is um, always speaking the final word. Help us to be the ones who are willing to um, stop talking in a conflict and listen. Help us to be the ones who are willing to say first, I'm sorry, please forgive me. We can't do this without your grace and we ask for your help. For your glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, guys, take care and we'll see you next time. God bless.